hear me? So much going on in the spirit. It, I mean, we are, oh, you can feel it rumbling. No, I don't need that thing. There's a lot going on in the spirit realm. Uh, he is increasing our hunger. Gosh, it's just great to see you all. What a blessing to get to stand up in front of you. Very humbling. But as I got to several verses this week in my prayer time, he highlighted them very strongly. First, of course, always deals with me. He's talking to me, me, and then I wake up and I realize, oh, wait a minute, there's unction on this. The, he keeps giving me verses. Can you shut that back door? It's just glary. Yeah, thank you. Um, Lynette getting up here saying that we're, uh, uh, we're pregnant. We've got twins. That's what James Gall said when he came just several weeks ago. He said that the church are, that he said me, but me representing the church, were carrying twins and that it was the harvest and that it was also the apostolic release that uh, we have been waiting for for Mr. Ricky here, <laughs> which I know, and that's exactly what I've been interceding for. But I had a dream I can probably count on one hand the meaningful dreams in my entire life. And one of the dreams was I had given birth, this was, oh, it wasn't 30, maybe 20, I don't know, 10, 20, long time, that's the point. That I had had twins and that uh, we were sitting out like outside in a park and uh, they were on a blanket, they were newborns, and the second, the one that came second, I don't know what that significance is, began to push up and stand up on the little blanket that we were on and began to walk. And I woke up, and it was very similar to your dream that there is, uh, going to be a momentum that's coming. You can feel it in the worship. You can feel that momentum. And I'm basically getting up here and telling you that it is a sovereign season. It is a kairos time. And that word kairos, pro you'll reap if you faint not. You'll reap at the proper time if you faint not. That proper time has the meaning of ownership. And there is a Cairo sovereign proper time that you own already given you by the Lord in personally and corporately. You, he's already said it's yours if, what did he say? If you faint not, Galatians 6, 9, you shall surely reap. In fact, did I give you that, Sean? 6, 9, can we just look at that? That's the verse I was supposed to end with. <laughs> Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. That proper time is that kairos time that we already own in the spirit. We're not trying to get it, we own it. It's been ordained by the Lord. You've had, you have kairos times in your personal life that are already yours, but what's the key? If, 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 if you work really hard, if you push and strive and push, no, if you don't give up. Uh, another translation uh, says lose heart, but that lose heart is in the context of lose courage. If you don't faint, if you don't relax your grip, if you don't let go, those are all different uh, translations. Uh, lose heart, if you don't turn out to be a coward, if you don't quit in the face of trials and difficulties. So if we're going to reap in this season a guaranteed Kairos time, a set time of fulfillment, of blessing, of seeing promises fulfilled, the one condition is that we don't relax our grip. 
We don't let go. We don't give up. We don't quit. We don't grow tired. It means there's going to be a lot of opportunity to do all of that. So what is he saying? Hold on. I'm just, I got a real simple message. Hold on. Be brave. Don't give up your courage. The Kairos time is at hand. And I, I, we know the enemy would put his greatest pressure right before the release in your personal lives, in our lives, corporately as a church. Okay, the Lord is announcing, he announced today through the prophetic word, and I, last time I taught, I said the same thing, it's time to birth, okay, it's time, you're going to, you're going to have a baby, you're going to see the promise, when you have the baby, you've got the promise right there. And he's announced, and you know, Lynette, we'll put this, we need to probably uh, maybe put it out on the table or send it as an email. Uh, Lynette was uh, patient enough and kind enough to compile what Terry Bennett came and said. He overheard the angels talking about a building for us. Then James Gall came just weeks later, didn't know a thing, said, your building is at hand. Lynette prophesied a very powerful word in our women's ministry whenever we last had it about the Lord wants to put us in our building because he wants to have a portal, a place of his glory where it can be kept open 24-7. So why is he announcing these things? What, birthing? Okay, Neville, if you read Neville, Neville Johnson, if you uh, read, if you've heard Dutch Sheets lately, his tape, by the way, I highly recommend, 2015, the turnaround year, that's Dutch Sheets. They're talking about a sovereign season. Dutch was talking about, he gave it in January, the next six months. Neville's talking, was talking, saying he gave it last October. He's talking about nine months. That's until June. There is a sovereign season to pray. It's always prayer. It's always prayer. There's no other way. There's no other way we get what the Lord's promised. We don't give up and we continue to knock. That, I mean, that's, that's just... That's what, that's what he's ordained. Because in prayer, there is an intimacy and, a, and his heart that he releases to us. But I want to finish this thought before I forget it. When he announces these things, okay, when he starts stirring things in your life, when you start to see that there's been a shift, that something's going on, you can feel it in worship. You can feel the prophets are saying uh, that this is a sovereign time to birth. We heard it again today. We've been told about a building. Okay, is he announcing it just to get us? Oh boy, this is great. No, no he's announcing it to call out of us the response necessary to bring to pass what he's saying to us. Right. He doesn't, he wants to do it with us. Because we're changed in the process of praying, of knocking, of not giving up, of holding on to courage, of keeping our hearts strong. And one primary way he does this is corporate prayer. Right. We're called to pray. We're called to have our prayer time. But there is a catalytic, dynamic aspect to corporate prayer that he's called us to. So he is announcing a change for us. And I believe it also, what's happening corporately also is going to happen individually. There's a change. We, we can feel it. There's a change. There's shifting going on, and we want to cooperate, don't we, with what the Spirit's saying. I mean, you, this is what you want. Part of me struggled with this message again because I thought, I'm preaching to the choir. They know. But we need to be encouraged again because if we will grow weary, we will faint. He wouldn't say that. Paul wouldn't have said this if this wasn't a very real possibility. I needed this. 
This was what he was dealing with me. Pam, I'm calling you to renewed prayer. And one way we offer that is Sunday morning from 9 to 9.50. We're tr we're, we don't have a building. It's hard to come out during the week. We kind of banged away on a Wednesday night prayer for you did faithfully for years and a small handful of you. It's very hard to get out during the week. So it was like, ding dong, make it easier. Do prayer before service and at, from 12.30 to 1.30, take an hour, set it, and go pray. Pray as a church. And this is what I'm standing up here saying again. He's calling us to a renewed time of prayer because the Kairos proper time is at hand. Okay? Do you want, uh, Sean, Luke 17, 26. This just, ooh, this is what got me this week. Okay, uh, this is Jesus speaking. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. So he's saying right here, if you want to know what it's going to be like in these last days, I want you to look at the days of Noah. That's what he says. It's going to be the same type of atmosphere, okay? So we, this is our time he's talking about. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came. Go ahead, Sean. And what? Destroyed them all. Okay? It was the same. He's saying this is the Lord speaking. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking. Okay, we eat and drink. That's what we do to stay alive. Nothing wrong with that. He, buying and selling. We buy, we buy food, we sell, we buy. We're planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven. And next. Did they know what was coming? What? I mean, are you kidding me? We're talking about they're killed. They're destroyed. The entire city is burned up, and they had not a clue. Everything was going on like it's always gone on. We're eating, we're drinking, we're marrying. Things are good. Life is vibrant. The culture is strong. Not a clue. I mean, it, that is shocking. So in Noah's day, who knew what was coming? How many knew what was coming? Yeah, Noah. And why, and why did his family know? Because he told them one man had revelation of what was coming. Total destruction. This is the culture we live in. Okay? It affects us. Sean, go, uh, can you pop up the message on that one? Luke 17. The, one guy had revelation. One guy. See, he was dealing with me. He's saying to me, Pam, you're waiting for a consensus. You want to see something more with your eyes. You want more uh, cultural affirmation, even Christian affirmation. In the body, there's great division about the difficulties that are coming. No, there's no difficulties coming. Okay? He, I mean, I, I, I sat there, I just wept. One man, I told one man, Pam, I told one man, I gave him revelation, and in holy fear, he built an ark. It says in the message, in the middle of dry ground. What? 
That is so understated, that is ridiculous. One man builds this, I don't even know what his family, I guess, his sons. How many years did it take to build this thing? How many people walked by? It's like, what are you doing? Yeah, you crazy. Water is going to be here? It's never been here. Never been here. We've never seen what's coming. We're being warned. I'm not saying total destruction. We're, God, we're praying, obviously, he's going to begin to spank the United States. We want to be spanked. There's, I don't even, we don't have to go into the litany of what's going on. It's evident for everybody to see. But what I want to emphasize is that the days of Noah are like today. And we cannot look at our culture in any way. I mean, you could see some things, obviously. But the pervasive culture is life carries on the way it always has. It doesn't change. Uh, the time of the Son of Man will be just like the time of Noah. Everyone carrying on as usual. I mean, the sun rises every day. It sets. We get up. We go to work. Everything. We have our routines. It's all just carrying on like it always has. Having Everyone carrying on as usual. Having a good time right up to the day Noah boarded the ship. Okay, let's just read the next line out loud together. They suspected the flood hit and swept everything away. What, my word, what did that look like? Same thing with Lot, carrying on, having a good time, business as usual. Right up to the day Lot walked out of Sodom, and what happened? A firestorm swept down and burned everything to a crisp. Okay, it's... We, we have to have an, an antidote to this. No, is that my singing it right? Yeah, when you... yeah. I just want to say anecdote. No, you want to have to have it. You have, what is the answer for a culture that is clueless? Not only, it's not just ignorance. If you just pop up 2 Peter 3, 3, Sean. We're also contending with a spirit of mockery, just like uh, Noah did. I have it inside me. I don't have to have somebody do it to me. My own logical thinking and my own stupid carnal mind without the uh, enlightenment of the Holy Spirit is, what? You're, you're saying what? You're saying we're going to have an economic crisis? You're going to what? I mean, it doesn't matter what we think it is. The times are the same, the Lord says. Above all, this is... Peter speaking, above all, says, first off, another translation. So this is super important. You must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Isn't that it? It's not going to change. This life, we're rooted in this life. This is the life we know day in and day out. But he's saying we have to be prepared for change. We have to be prepared for whatever the Lord is bringing. He wants a people that he can work with, not a people caught off guard like the world. They're going to be caught off. They're not only ignorant, they're scoffing. That scoffing is, I, I'm sorry, that cynicism is in me. I, I, I repent repeatedly for that. Unbelief. It said, Noah in holy fear warned of things not seen. 
We are being warned of things we have not seen. So that doesn't, so right away my mind goes, oh, well, that's not, it's not going to happen then. I mean, I've never seen it. There's Noah's boat out in the middle of dry ground. He built it there. I mean, years that it had to take to build that thing. People walking by every day, his neighbors. How many laughed? How many scoffed? How many mocked? How much did Noah struggle in his own heart? Mm. See, I mean, we're not airtight. We're human. We want to fit in. We want to not be the fish swim, you know, swimming upstream. But sorry, that's what we're called to be. I love what Terry Bennett said. He said, Terry Bennett, he said, a prophet, and I'm seeing an, a, the body of Christ that has ears opened, stands in the middle of a raging stream facing the other way against the current and pointing in the opposite direction. How do we stay strong in this? How do we begin to be prepared about something we've never, ever seen? How do we wake up? Okay, you want to know? Mike Bickle brought this point out. I just, and he's right. I mean, it's very clear. The main, I'm just going to read what Mike said. Watching is the main exhortation that Jesus gives us in the context of preparing for victory in the end times. Watching, being alert, being awake. Watchful to be watchful is to have a lifestyle of prayer with obedience. Keyword, lifestyle. Everything in our culture fights against this. Everything in you, as just in your carnality, fights against this. He gave me the verse years ago, the violent take the kingdom, and they take it by force. He said to me, you are going to have to be violent with yourself to guard your prayer time, to be obedient, because every single day, you will have to make a choice every single day. It never lets up. I'm still in the, no one's ever going to make it easy for you, let alone the enemy. Our whole culture is based around a false reality and a continual uh, putting out of that culture to constantly entertain us and distract us. It's not evil. We, we are meant to have a good time. We're meant to eat and drink. We're meant to eat well. There's nothing wrong with that. But what occupies us, that's the key word, occupies. What takes the majority of our time, okay? D just uh, watchful, watching I'm going to read it again. It's the main thing that Jesus gives us in the context of preparing for victory in the end times. It's the number one thing to keep us awake, alert, and undistracted. Our willpower will not do it. Our I love you, Lord. I love you. It's not going to do it. It's too pervasive. It's too strong. Our culture is inundating. We, we market it around the world. We live in Hollywood, guys. You know that. But we have more grace, okay? Matthew, uh, Sean, Matthew uh, 24, 42, just a couple of verses on keeping watch. All Jesus said them, therefore, okay, we just read Matthew 24. It was just up earlier talking about the days of Noah and the days of Lot. That's, this comes right after that. So here's what you do. 
The culture is pervasive. It wants to capture you totally. It's based on entertainment. It's based on a false reality. Your own mind just gravitates that way. Here's what you do. Here's the answer. Jesus said it. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come or you do not know what's ahead for us. We've got glimpses of what's coming, but we don't know. Keeping watch, it also, and I didn't give you this verse, I'll just say it, Mark 13, 33. It says, be on guard, be alert. And this is Jesus. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. The message translation says, stay at your post. It is so hard. But we can start, we can, this is what happened, I feel, for me. I, years ago, I planted a, a, a stake, as it were, in the ground of personal prayer. And I fought, and I, I'm fighting to this day for, to be obedient to what he's saying he wants of me, okay? In my life right now, with my kids older, being in the ministry. So I fight for that thing, and I feel like there's a constant wind trying to pull me away from that thing. But as I fought to hold that ground, falling a million trillion times, getting back up, holding on again, getting, getting back up, holding on again, mistake after mistake. It doesn't matter how many times this happens. You're getting stronger every time you get back up and grab a hold. It became, it became the focus of my life. Everything became regulated on that one issue. Was I spending time alone with the Lord? Okay. I believe corporate prayer can be the same way. If you take a stake, you set it in. Okay, I'm going to come one, one time a month. I'm going to come every other Sunday. I'm going to come. I don't know what it is. The Lord will author that in your heart and give you grace. But you plant that, and then you're blowing off. You come back. You, blow, you come back. It's just strengthening you. It's strengthening you. It gives us a focus instead of just, you know what, um, uh, in uh, Luke, it says the cares of this life. Oh, in fact, you know what, Sean? Let's just go there. Luke 27, 34. Did I give you that? Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, thank you. 21. I'm glad you're not listening to me, Sean. Uh, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness. This is a trip to me. And the anxieties of life. The anxieties of life is just as deadly as drunkenness. Carousing is self-indulgence. This is Jesus again. Be careful or your hearts will be overwhelmed. Another translation says burdened down with self-indulgent living, carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. Okay, that word, anxieties, it literally means to divide the mind, to just get it going. We've all, we, we all have it. My mind could just be going in 50 million directions. I can't even think straight. It means divide the mind. It means to distract and to worry about daily life. It's being, again, occupied that's a key word. Doesn't mean we don't worry a little bit. He doesn't want us to, but I know we do. It's being occupied with problems of this life, just like the rest of the world. Okay? So he says the anxieties, the division of literally your mind becomes divided, and that day will close on you suddenly. caught. It's too late. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. This is so huge. Be always on the watch. Here it is. Here we go. 
Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. So he gives us the answer very clearly. It's watch and pray. Stay, that's how you stay awake. That's how you stay focused. You'll be blown off course, but something every time you get back and you grip a hold of what really matters in life, again, that stake in your life, you're strengthened, you're blessed. The Lord, in fact, you actually get a growth spurt uh, after you've made a mistake. In fact, you know what? Boy, it's going to fit in, Sean. Let's go to Jesus Calling. Yahoo! I didn't think it was going to fit in. Okay. I was reading my journal, going back through some pages, and I had written this up at the top of a page. It's from, uh, you know, Sarah Young's Jesus Calling. How many of you guys read that? Oh, bless you. Aren't you blessed? Okay, this was January 5th. I did, uh, okay. You, listen to this. You can achieve the victorious life through living in deep dependence on me. Okay? People usually associate victory with success. And that means not falling, not stumbling, not making mistakes. That's what we think. Okay? Victory means I'm not falling, I'm not going to stumble, I'm not going to make mistakes. But those who are successful in their own strength tend to go their own way, forgetting about me, forgetting about me. Hey, don't we? If we can do it, we'll do it. Don't need the Lord. I can do it. It is through problems and, say that word, failure, failure, failure weakness, and neediness that you learn to rely on me. This is a process. I may plant within you a dream that seems far beyond your reach. You know that in yourself you cannot achieve such a goal. You know what? I don't even have a dream. I just can't even live daily life without him. How about you? I, I, can't, I can't even be a good wife, mother without him. Oh my God, boom. Nosedive immediately. You know that in yourself you cannot achieve such a goal. Thus begins your journey. It's a journey of profound reliance on me. Now here's my favorite part. It is a faith walk taken one step at a time, leaning on me as much as you need. Here it is. This is not a path of continual success, but of multiple failures. Yes. However, each failure is followed by a growth spurt, nourished by increased reliance on me. Why do you have a growth spurt after a failure? Because you're relying on him more. You just blew it. You know you don't have it. So you rely on him more, you instantly go into a growth spurt. <laughs> Enjoy the blessedness of a victorious life through deepening your dependence on me. Yeah, let's really. Thank you, Lord. This is not a path of continual success, but of multiple failures. It's the same with our walk right now. Corporate prayer, personal prayer, everything, everything. We are going against our carnal nature. We are going against uh, the culture. And so we desperately need him. And he's, he's planned it that way. He made it that way. He doesn't want us doing it on our own. He wants to do it through us, do it in us, make us into who we really are called to be. Okay, so then now, and so when I went to this, I had also written out what Rick Joyner had written in The Harvest. Do you have that, Sean? That next part? Yeah. This was on page 93. Everyone, everyone, I so respect Rick Joyner. Everyone who has been through the fire of failure, 
who keep seeking the Lord and pressing on will have their failures turned into spiritual authority that will move mountains for others. What? Only God, only God could take our failure and turn it into spiritual authority that blesses others. Just weeks after Peter denied the Lord, he, and who did he deny the Lord? He denied the Lord three times to a servant girl, okay? Absolutely denies the Lord who he had been with, went out and wept bitterly, it says. Just weeks after Peter denied the Lord, he testified of his lordship with such authority that the greatest powers of his nation would marvel at him. The Lord will do the same for all who just keep going and refuse to let their failures stop them. Thank you, Lord. So we're on a journey to be awake, to be alert, to be focused, to be cooperating with him, to be a body that he will actually move and do work through and do miracles through and, and bless through. I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. John, can you put up uh, Luke 21, 26? I wanted to show you something. Yeah. Should I turn that off? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, 21, 26. You know, it's amazing. I want to um, uh, also give you another perspective on this. I've been wanting to tell you. Those of you that know, um, people will faint from what? Yeah. See, th this is, you know, I remember it was over 20 years ago walking down the street one day. One of my neighbors was going through a very difficult time, Bob. I didn't get to talk to him much. And uh, he said, uh, uh, you know, he goes, oh, I'm just struggling. He goes, I need to find my higher power. I said, Bob, do you have a Bible? He goes, yeah, I think so. I go, go read Matthew 24. Matthew 24. It's Luke 21, Matthew 24, the same. I said, you'll find out that Jesus, his words are pertinent for us today, and particularly the words of his comfort and love. And uh, anyway, but uh, in Luke 21, 26 here, if you look at the news, it's almost always about terrorism. Now it's a plane crash. Then it's bombings here, several people killed here. But you see, it's exactly what Jesus said. There will be powers of darkness that bring terror so that our what? Uh, people will faint. It says lose heart, actually. People's hearts will fail from terror, apprehensive of what is coming upon the world. Even the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And that's good news, the heavenly bodies, where demonic powers are. God's going to shake the heavens and the earth. But um, anyway, what I want to get at is, is that these are pertinent things for us as believers. And then on the flip side, I want to say this real clearly. A year ago, January 12th, when Terry came and those angels came in here and we had, huh? And we had, um, yeah, we had th this angel come in and uh, many, of us were, many of us were weeping on our faces and so forth. And this angel came to bring a seed of glory. He had told us that, that the womb of this church was pregnant with the glory of God. Well, now it's a year and whatever, 14 months late or 14 months later. But the last several months, I'm just telling you this ahead of time. Second Corinthians uh, 4, 6 says, May the light of the knowledge of the glory of God that shines from the face of Jesus Christ shine into your heart. That's been happening to me off and on, off and on. Now, not where I'm seeing a great cloud of glory, but I'm feeling. I feel it all over my hands, on my face, and it keeps me focused on the Lord longer than I ever have in my 30, 36 years in ministry. It is happening. It is happening to me. It's happening with my wife. I don't want to sound like we're super spiritual, but when the, when the glory of God starts coming in and hovering over you, it's easy to stay focused on Jesus like I never have before. This is the way. 
my brothers and sisters, that the bride gets herself ready. It's the light of the knowledge of the glory of God shining from the face of Jesus Christ, shining into you because he's coming back for a church in Doxos, that which is living in and, and receiving from and dwelling in the environment of the glory of God. It's happening to me, I'm telling you. I can feel it. I sense it. It's coming on me. Sometimes it's so heavy on my hands. I feel like I must be having like huge uh, white uh, like uh, cotton gloves on my hands or something. I feel it, you know. I've had it come before over the years, but he's, here's the point. He's coming. The king of glory is coming. He's coming to your prayer closet. That's where he's coming. That's what I've been preaching for the last year and a half. And uh, so I want to pray that blessing over you because every day you read about ISIS. They're, they're coming here now. Now they're going after the military. You know that in our nation. They're t- saying, find out, you know where the military live. We want you to go and, and all this stuff. So all I can tell you is, is, is that we are the ones If we're living close to Jesus, you're a Psalm 91 believer. And a Psalm 91 believer is hiding in the secret place of the Most High. A thousand at your right hand, ten thousand at your uh, left hand, whatever, ten thousand at your right hand. The Lord will protect us in the coming days. We are not going to be living in fear because of the terror. But many are and many will. But not us. As we seek the Lord, he takes that stuff out of me. You know, having kids like we do and now grandchild and so forth, and let alone all of you driving around and we hear about different things going on. We had two of our sisters, uh, three of our sisters. uh, The Lord protected them in what could have been a death you know, uh, a killing in, in the car accidents. But we just pray, Lord, for Psalm 91 believers to be raised up here. We are going on, we're pressing on to become part of the bride of Christ who gets herself ready by seeking the face of God. May the light of the knowledge of the glory of God that shines from the face of Jesus Christ shine into your hearts, transforming you. See, many times when I'm preaching, I called out several of you because I see you sometimes when I'm preaching, I see you just your face lifted to God and you're receiving from your king. He is imparting himself to you. Listen, he is imparting himself to us. He is more than enough. Well, pastor, I'm a little bit afraid about the things. Every time we read about ISIS, I mean, it's just like, let's, you know, jam up the terrorism, you know, you know, I mean, in other words, just, just. Send it all over the world. No. Lord, thank you that you're going to protect me. Thank you you're going to warn me if I'm not supposed to get on an airplane. I've had demonic powers come to me when I was in India and many other places, at least two or three in Africa and stuff. They'd come up and tell me they're going to kill me. You know? It's like there's one problem. I'm in God. No, I'm in God. They'd come right up, put their nose to my nose, say, we're going to kill you. I would just stand there and say, oh, my gosh, I'm so thankful. I am in Christ Jesus. Yes, I'm in the Lord, and you are in Christ Jesus, my friends. The ark of God is your Savior, and he's watching over you. But we cannot deny these verses, you know. You got that one up there. Yeah, but you can't deny the fact that many people's hearts will fail because of the terrorism that's coming upon the earth, the fear that Satan's biggest thing. He wants us to be afraid of everything. There's a holy fear that washes you and purifies you. And there's a demonic fear that just wants to paralyze you. So we come against all fear concerning what's coming in these end time days. Let's stand up. Lord, listen, you know, you hear about Pam and I praying and so forth, and and, uh, that's great. But we also, our schedules are different than a lot of you. We don't have kids in the home now except my Uh, nephew who lives with us and occasionally our our kids come like today praise God but uh, (laughs) yes but what I'm saying is 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 that the mornings for us we don't have to get up many times I don't have things in the morning so I don't want you to be feeling guilty just know this Jesus Christ God the Father the Holy Spirit they love you they love you and they want you to come in and spend time with them however you can. Do it. Focus on the Lord even when you're driving. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Do not waste time being condemned and saying my prayer life has been shoddy for the last 20 years. I'm feeling guilty. It's not the Lord. I'm telling you, he's simply saying, knock it off. Come in. Let's start. Come on. Jesus is so kind. He's so forgiving. It's just like, look, 
Forget it. That's negative stuff. Let's just go for it. I'm with you. I love you. I'm going to work with you. I love the fact that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, they always say, do you want any help? Yes. You're supposed to say, yes, Lord. I'm failing in this area. Thank you. Help me, Jesus. So here's your big prayer this morning. Say this. Say, Lord. You can see if you can remember this prayer. Help me, Lord. Help me be a prayer warrior. Help me be faithful. Help me be a Psalm 91 Christian. Help me say no to all fear, all condemnation. Wash me clean by your forgiveness and your love. Thank you for being so nice. You've got great plans for me and for my family and for my friends and for my city and even people I work with. You don't want anybody to perish. And you want me, just little old me, to pray. And you'll hear my cry for my friends and my relatives, the people that I work with. I may be the only believer that knows you to pray to you so that they can be drawn. Use me, Lord. I'm your child, your servant. Thank you for loving me. Help me remember, even this week, of the price that Jesus paid to redeem me. And I'm going to look to him. He's the author and the finisher of my faith. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah.